Hello and welcome to America Latina Story. The history of America Latina goes from the earliest days of man on earth to the recent past. Today's subject is concerned with the latter. It happened less than a century ago. By the turn of the 20th century, Henry Ford's reputation as a man who transformed the world had reached all parts of the globe, like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates today. Hadn't he rationalized the industry and the assembly lines? Didn't he pay his employees twice as much as everyone else? Didn't he allow the middle classes to change their way of life? by encouraging them to buy sound and practical cars like the Ford T. Wasn't he one of the richest and most powerful men on the planet? It seemed like everything he touched turned to success. It is the 1920s. Great Britain had dispossessed the Amazon region of its monopoly on latex production through its plantations in Ceylon and Asia, which were rationalized and known to be pest-free. As they had done with the tea seeds of China with Robert Fortune, the English had, in 1876, smuggled three seeds from Brazil to England by Henry Wickham. This British monopoly was seriously damaging Ford who was seeking to reduce the production costs of his new models, notably by producing its tires. His research led him to Brazil, where the latex tree, otherwise known as cao chu or weeping wood, is a native species. Industrialist, Henry Ford was also a visionary. Taking up the pioneer's raison d'être, he wanted to shape the world to his ideas. As there were no more virgin territories in the west of the United States, Brazil, with its immense territory, was perfectly suited to his project, the building for his employees of an ideal city to support his industrial installation for producing latex. In 1927, Ford acquired from the Brazilian government for $125,000 a 10,000 square kilometer concession located on the southern bank of the Tapajos River near the town of Santarém, about 960 kilometers from the mouth of the Amazon. The construction of the ideal city to be named Fordlandia, no less, started very quickly. Everything came but bought from North America. Prefabricated houses, furniture, materials and equipment, factory components, machines, cables, pipe. A hospital was built, the most modern and the best in South America, open to all and free. The city had a school, an auditorium, a cinema, a dance hall, a golf course, a swimming pool. The streets were paved and, at night, public lightning illuminated the place. Fordlandia also possessed its power station, running water, sewers, everything had been planned for the comfort of the inhabitants. Several shops completed the town. The rules of life in Fordlandia were very strict, according to a Puritan model. Neither alcohol nor places of debauchery were permitted. But this was to no avail, for they went to settle on a neighboring island aptly named the Island of the Innocents. Ford wanted to make his employees model citizens according to the imagery of a golden age that would have existed in pioneer times. Industrious activities, the care given to the tending of mother health, healthy vegetarian meals, 
and healthy relaxation divided the day. However, Ford rejected any intrusion of spirituality into his domain. Unlike the custom and tradition in Latin America, and indeed the vast majority of human societies, God was not one of the foundations on which he built his ideal society. And the church that can be seen today was built after the original settlers had abandoned the city. If North American workers could comply with these rules, they went against the grain of local workers, and Ford had to call in the Brazilian military in 1930 to quell a revolt and rampage in his town. However, the latest plantation project was going from bad to worse. Ford had not taken the precaution of surrounding himself with botanists, and his thousands of trees fell victim to caterpillars. Several subsequent attempts suffered the same fate. In 1945, with the advent of synthetic rubber, Ford's project became obsolete. His descendant, Henry Ford II, resold the concession to the Brazilian government with a huge loss. Overnight, the North American employees packed up, leaving the Brazilians in a city that had lost its raison d'être. The government took matters in hand for a while. A significant part of the material disappeared. Then, as with everything, nature resumed its rights. Today, Fordlandia is not completely dead. 3,000 inhabitants live on its ruins while waiting for they do not know what. Thank you for watching this program. Do not hesitate to subscribe to the channel. This is all for now. Goodbye.